All right, and now we welcome on head men's basketball coach of Oral Roberts, Paul Mills. Paul, how are you doing today? Great, Rick, great. Really good to be here. Thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Um, really excited to talk college basketball. We've had some uh, really good coaching interviews uh, so far in the past few weeks. I'm sure this will be no different, so let's hop right into it. Um, and let's actually take a trip back uh, to 2018-2019 and talk about uh, your second season, because I remember that year. Um, it, w it was a tough year, and there was some tough uh, injury timing, uh, notably, most notably to Emmanuel Zaquezi, who – you know, got hurt in the middle of conference play. Same thing kind of happened with Sam Kearns, and it, and it kind of hurt the team a little bit. Um, but then luckily this past year, you guys had the injury luck go in your favor. Zaquezi had, you know, a healthy year. He had the awesome season that everyone knew he was capable of. Um, so while health definitely played a factor this year, it wasn't the only reason you guys had such a big improvement year over year. So what, do you, what would you say uh, had, gets the most credit for the major jump this past season? Well, one, players always get the credit. Coaches, you know, never make a shot, never get a rebound. <laughs> and so we had really good players. Uh, my first year uh, when I took the job, um, you were taking over a team that, that hadn't won. And, and really good players left behind, but there were seniors. And took the job late, took it May well after the signing period. And so I just made the decision of they're not going to fire me after the first year, <laughs> uh, regardless of how good or bad this goes. Um, and so I just said, you know what, we're going to roll with what we have and then bring in a whole bunch of new guys. So year two, we brought in nine new players. And you can imagine trying to get nine new guys mm -hmm. on the same page. And then – both of our point guards went down before the year ever started um, and then had injuries in there. And so nine new players, no point guard. It was like having a running back playing quarterback. Uh, and those guys did a great job um, who we would have fill in at that particular spot. But all of that, and then you had guys returning this year. You know, my second year we had guys playing the conference tournament who had never been uh, in a conference tournament setting. The majority, none of our starters had. And so to have those guys and then to have them back uh, for year number two, I thought what happened the second year is Kevin O'Banner became a, an All-American as a freshman. Um, he was the fourth most efficient player in the country. Uh, Zion was one, Rui Hachimera two, Grant Williams was three, and then Kevin was four as a rookie. And so – E-Man getting hurt, Emmanuel Nezaquazi getting hurt, allowed Kevin to kind of thrive and get better. And then I think in year three, we've kind of had this pendulum swing in the direction that we need it to go. Yeah, it seemed like everything, you know, kind of fell together. And, and you know, ultimately, you know, it, it, it led to a really, really successful season for you guys. Um, so I also wanted to – I was also looking at uh, some of the past, you know, years – you know, not just your time at Oral Roberts, but but in general, um, that the university, uh, the, the basketball team as a whole, um, it's been more of a, an offensive-based program, uh, and there's been struggles uh, on the defensive end. But I think one of the biggest reasons why you guys had a lot of success this year was because it was such a massive leap defensively. You know, you had one of the best defensive seasons all decade for or for Oral Roberts. Um, so what what did you do specifically to kind of get the team to that level defensively? Yeah, I, I learned this one from Stan Van Gundy and just listening to him talk through various things. But he said, if you don't want to turn the ball over, don't play players who turn the ball over. Uh, you know what? If you want to be good defensively, play the guys that care about that end of the court. And you try to convey to the guys the importance of not playing just half the game. I will say we were second in the country at not turning it over. Notre Dame was one. Yeah. We were number two. And, and that helps you better defensively. Mm -hmm. The less you're in transition defense or playing disadvantaged basketball because you're turning it over, giving it to the other team, you're going to be better defensively. Um, we did have a more than 100-point jump, um, but that's because we were so bad uh in, in my second year so impressive. But, so, so yeah impressive. and then just had a huge jump but I think some of that is just guys understanding uh some of that is when you have nine new guys 
and the majority are freshmen. Um, and you're going to sit there and you're just going to pull your hair out. But I think what you do have to have is a bigger vision. Um, you have to understand just where this is headed. What are you trying to do? Where is this going? And I do think sometimes getting uh, punched in the face a little bit will cause you to kind of bow up, understand the urgency at which things need to be done. And I, I look back get all of that is wonderful learning lessons not only for me but for our players and I think not turning it over and playing guys who really cared about that end of the court were the two biggest contributing factors to us improving there well you you kind of talked about the two of my two of my next questions uh, I, I was going to mention you know the second in the nation in turnover percentage yeah you didn't think I was going to like let that like linger you know that's like a talking <laughs> point you get out in like the first two minutes <laughs> I, was, I mean it's impressive it's I, in the entire country and then of course you know the only team better Notre Dame a, no, a notoriously you know good team at, at taking care of the ball and obviously you know a huge jump even from where you guys were at last year but I'm sure you know the turnovers uh or taking care of the ball uh per se will be a staple for Oral Roberts basketball for you. And, and are you, do you think that there's maybe, um, is there a merit toward fo maybe focusing on either the offensive or de defensive end, or do you guys ultimately strive to have that balance? Yeah. I mean, I heard Mark Bray has a, um, a plaque in his office that says, take care of the ball and go to class. <laughs> uh, like those are the two rules. I don't necessarily care as much about going to class, given the fact that <laughs> virtually so much is happening virtually now. So I guess going to class is sitting, looking at your iPhone nowadays. But uh, we do want you to take care of the ball, more so because it has such a, in my mind, a big factor on transition defense. And it plays such a huge part. I mean, I, I think coaches have done a really good job utilizing this space during the pandemic. And I've been able to be on Zoom calls with hundreds of coaches and listen to some of the feedback from European coaches and NBA coaches. And one of the things that everybody points out is the points per possession um, in the first seven seconds, how much higher it is versus if you're waiting late shot clock or even in that middle shot clock. So the value there of taking care of the ball plays on that. Now, I will tell you that I think the big part of that is you want players to be instinctive. You don't want to be run here, point A, then you go to point B, then C, and they just become, you know, the, the more their brains are moving, the slower their feet are. And so you need to make sure that those guys are instinctive as possible. Um, and so you're just trying to make sure they have space. And we had, I think in today's game, you have to play two ball handlers. Um, you see that with the Rockets. Uh, you see that with Portland. You see it in Utah. Um, really good basketball teams. Golden State has a whole team of them when they had KD there. But if Chris is the only point guard and we got to throw to Joe, we're like, Joe can't make decisions. No, I can't. And, and, uh, and so, so you have to have two guys. Hey, they trap him. They throw to the other guy. And at least your guys aren't in a scramble mode. So we had two point guards who did a good job, but they also cared about defending. And we do want to make that a staple of our program. Um, but I think that comes with playing multiple ball handlers um, who can make decisions and create for other people. Hey, the Thunder were a team, another team who, you know, right there in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. great job this year playing multiple ball. Well, they did three sometimes. Yeah, I think in today's game, you have to. Again, if you only have one playmaker, they're going to go trap him, get the ball out of his hands and say, hey, throw it to the non-playmakers. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Yeah. And, and so having multiple guys on the court who can do that is, uh, is, is significant and it's important for offense and defense. We're, we're big fans of the uh, take care of the ball style. I mean, uh, some of my favorite uh, programs in the nation, uh, you know, Wisconsin, Virginia, uh, Notre Dame, like you mentioned. So, you know, maybe it could be if – you, if you keep this up, Bo Ryan, Tony Bennett, Mike Bray, Paul Mills, can we make a big <laughs> a Mount Rushmore of uh, – Yeah, of, of taking care of the ball. Yeah. The good thing is – and uh, listen, Tony, um, I, I was having this conversation. Um, with another coach, Tim Jankovic at SMU. 
And he's like, Tony Bennett is the best in our profession. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. Really <laughs> um, and so this is not a knock, but those guys also play the slowest pace. Yep. Um, at three. And so for us to take care of the ball, be top 70 in the country in tempo yep. and be able, you want to be able to play with speed without, you know, I just, I, I tell our guys, guys, we don't want to help the other team more than we help our own. So if you're giving the ball to the other team more than you're assisting ours, it's not a good combination. And so we don't pay attention to a lot. Um, we basically pay attention to three. But one of them is we ask our guys to not turn it over more than 15% of the time. You're going to have them. We understand it. I had them when I played and I wasn't very good. You guys are a lot better. But I don't think when, you, when the ball's in your hands – and you don't give it to the other team less than one out of every five possessions, I don't think that's asking a lot. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is if you're around that number, man, I don't give the other team the ball. Every five times I touch it, I only give it to them once. And right. you're going to be one of the better teams in the country. Right. And so we do try to let our guys know that our job is not to help the other team. Our job is to help ours. So let's not give them the ball whether that be through selfishness, bad shots, turnovers, all those things that, that kind of come into play. But it is something that we do talk about. You make, you make a great point with the tempo, too. Um, and, you know, I, I was just, you know, glancing through your schedule uh, before the, uh, the show, you know, the interview started. You, you, you played a couple of those teams that play a quicker tempo and take care of the basketball pretty well. Uh, you know, I was on there, Creighton. BYU, good examples of, you know, big power school team, power conference teams that are playing a faster pace, very good offensive teams. Almost, it seems like kind of, you know, what you're modeling your system to be. Is that by design? Do you want to play those types of teams? And is that going to be the, you know, what you do going forward? Well, as you know, some of it at the mid-major level is just budget issues. Of course. And, uh, and, and you know, you, you play five, um, uh, games on the road. Uh, uh, we played the sixth toughest schedule in the country last yep. year in the non-conference. And when you look at our our losses in the non-conference, we had six of them. Um, three of them were all top 15 teams. Iowa was really good. BYU was good. Creighton was good. Uh, Tulsa ended up winning the American League. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, that, I mean, the teams that we played, Oklahoma State, which is right down the road, and and I think in that game there were 88 possessions, um, and we ended up losing 80 to 75. You're right. Yeah. You're a number. Yeah, 85 guy. to 80. Somewhere yeah, you have, you have, we have all these numbers in our questions and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and so to play fast and to do that, yep. and at the same time, like, the, again, I mean, I just, hey, take care of the ball. And then we don't want the other team to score better than a point of possession. Mm -hmm. And in and, and my three years here, we're 26-1 and one when that doesn't happen. The one game we lost was, was Oklahoma State. And so I think you can kind of show our guys that. And without getting wonky on them and nerdy on them and having them guys like you're making me think through much, too much. And uh, it's just, guys, try to stop your guy from scoring. Do the best you can. And, uh, and then let's not give the ball to the other team. That's going to help them not score. And so we try to keep it as simple as possible with also utilizing some metric in order to hold them accountable. Yeah, it sounds simplified, but if you do it, you know, you're going to be real successful. Let me, I'm going to try to stump you on a stat now. Let's see if you know. Oh. <laughs> the Summit League has been top two in the nation year after year for seven straight years in one category. Do you know what it is? It would have to be three-point shooting. Uh, it was free throw shooting, actually. Close. Okay. I, I got to tell hey, you. I, I, go ahead. You're going to get me going here. because uh, <laughs> If you so, look at the last decade, just let's just do the last decade yep. of 32 conferences. Um, so this isn't like they were good one or two years. Over the last decade, number one in threes percentage, number one in two percentage, number one in free throw percentage, number one in offensive efficiency, number one in effective field goal percentage five different categories the league I, I was in the big 12 for 14 years prior to coming here 
And, and, and Joe Dooley told me this, who's now at East Carolina, because he was at Kansas and then went to Florida Gulf Coast. And he said, Paul, you're not going to find guys who top of the square athletic. They're going to the eighth, ninth, tenth right. floor, and they're just getting shots. And you're going to sit there and be amazed by it. Um, but what you are going to find are highly skilled players. And that's what this league has. It has highly skilled guys. And we may not have the athletes, uh, we don't, of the ACC, Big 12, other Power Fives, but it is a really good league, really skilled league. And I, I think the coaches do a tremendous job um, in this league and having their teams prepared. You, you be, so you basically, you know, answered the question that I had without me even asking it. I mean, I feel that uh, I've been dying to ask somebody about free throw shooting, and, and you seem to be a perfect guy to ask because of how good the league has been. And it seems, you know, like a common fan type of question. You know, you, you figure free, you got to be able to shoot free throws to win. But I feel like it's over, it's undervalued in, in college basketball as a whole, and maybe it's because these coaches are looking for the top athletes and they, they're not as refined around, uh, the, you know, the free throw line or, or you know, in the mid-range or even from the three-point line. I, I, I would like to know from you, is this something that, you know, is, you kind of already answered it, but is this something that, that, you know, you guys are going out as coaches in the Summit League and, and looking for, or is it something that, you know, it's, it's the best you got so you could, you know, that's what you're settling for? I mean, where does it fall on the spectrum in terms of, uh, you know, where is it in terms of being a priority, free throw shooting, um, you know, in, in the landscape of, of your recruitment style? Yeah, so I would spend my summers with Coach Majerus in Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm -hmm. And if there was ever a guy who would tell you games are going to be won and lost at the free throw mm -hmm. line, it was Coach Majerus. And he would constantly talk about it. And, I mean, even in the summer as he was putting those guys through work and they were just shooting free throws on the side, he just – he couldn't stomach guys not being able to put themselves in – like thinking six months from now. Yep. I don't care that this is happening in June. I mean, you need to understand what's going to happen in March. And so I do think that you, you, there's a focus um, that you have to put on it. I, I do think that obviously guys can shoot the three. So you necessarily equate it to being able to also shoot a free throw. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that some people's skill set is shooting the ball specifically in this league. Um, it's not, again, I mean, if you look at turnovers caused, uh, we're like last. Um, this isn't a league that's going to put up a whole lot of pressure and get up in your face. And so you don't see a lot of guys. You have to get extended on the arc. You better be able to defend the three-point line in this league. And then you have to be able to guard without fouling because, um, hey, guys are going to go by and they're going to make penetration plays to other three-point shooters. But – some guys can really attack. Um, there's a kid at, at South Dakota, Stanley Amude, who is a really good player. Um, I mean, it, it is fringe NBA type of player. And so you have guys out there who can attack and be vicious on the rim and put a lot of pressure on it. But I, I do think that the ability to shoot free throws just comes from a natural ability to shoot, and that's what this league does. Very well said. Um, let's get to uh, some of your players. Um, looking forward to next year. I mean, freshman, uh, freshman Max Amnes, uh, he stepped up as one of the more productive players in your team. Um, you had a really nice showing from uh, a sophomore guard, RJ Fuqua, uh, you know, once he got healthy and then, you know, especially he picked it up towards the end of the season and in, in the summit league tournament. Um, and obviously having, you know, a guy like Emmanuel and, and someone like DeAndre Burns, who, um, you know, is a senior as well definitely helps but talk about this uh this backcourt that you've got going for next year and how you how you think they're going to improve with more experience under their belts yeah I, I mean as we all know games are won with guard play and you better have really good guard play um I like our guys Max was top 30 in the country at shooting threes as a freshman just in regards to volume um he was number one in our league. And the great thing about Max is his ability to score. And I think, you, you know, the old adage of the best thing about freshmen is they become sophomores. Uh, I, I've always thought that, but I thought that in the regards to with confidence. I think if you can play as a freshman 
and have a lot of confidence going in to your sophomore year, um, that is where I think guys really shine. Everybody says, well, look how much Michael improved. Well, Michael played a lot, uh, Jordan, uh, as a freshman to his sophomore year. And everybody, if you have that and I've got experience, I better understand what's asked of me. I think you'll do better. And Max is a natural scorer. Um, he weighs about 124 uh, on a good day. And so I, I didn't, that's a joke, but I didn't know if he would be able to even be able to play just like, bro, you weigh 135 pounds. <laughs> um, but he can score and really score and he can really shoot and, and really impressed with his work ethic and his approach. I think one of the guys I'm really high on is RJ Glasper. Uh, RJ was at Arkansas and his, his freshman year. Yeah. Um, and couldn't go to a Division One because he set out, and they had a really good team. Um, so he had to go to Division Two. And if you go look at his Division One games against, I know you had Chris Ogden on against UT Arlington and some other guys. He was really good. And so to have a guy like that being able to come in, um, that there's uh, players at at our who've been at Arkansas, Lee Mayberry is a famous name. Well, Lee coaches with our women, and Lee played in the NBA, but Lee was on the men's side at Arkansas. And he was like, I'm just telling you, R.J. Glasper can really hoop. And, and so going through it and watching him and seeing what he did, um, we're excited about him. And then I think we have a lot of depth there um, from that spot. And the other thing is, is one of the guys we have returning, Deshane Weaver, Played for us two years ago, shot 42% from three as a six foot eight. Um, and so I think our backcourt, when you throw in DJ and who we have, um, I feel really good just about where our guys stack up in comparison to the rest of the league. Yeah, I, I recently actually just read up a little bit on RJ and, and you know, hell, uh, we, you played really well at, uh, at Arkansas Tech and where you were, um, you know, you guys were getting him as a transfer. And then I remember. DJ too from two years ago. So, you know, obviously having guys like that um, along with uh, the other RJ uh, and Max coming in are, are going to be really helpful for the team. But you also have a really nice rec recruiting class coming in. Uh, most notably, you have uh, uh, Jamie Bergens and, uh, and Nathan Clover. And, and you know, having, uh, you know, two, two really nice uh, freshman pieces to come into the, the current core, I'm sure is going to be helpful. Um, but of course, the offseason has been weird. And, you know, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, how do you hope to kind of integrate these freshmen in a way that helps them get ready to contribute uh, essentially from day one? Yeah, the honest answer is I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, until you can really have these guys on campus yeah. and you can say, man, you're a great kid. Like you work hard. And we, we saw Jamie in Greece last year at uh, an under 18s FIBA. Um, playing for his national yeah. team and did a phenomenal job against really good competition. And you're like, man, that kid can play the top 150 player in the country. And we were able to get him here, but it, he, it's just, I mean, everybody's great until you ask him to do something hard. And then when you ask him to do something hard, you get a better idea about, all right. Uh, you know, as I share with our guys, if I squeeze a Coke can, um, Coke is going to come out. So we're going to squeeze you guys. And until we can really squeeze you, we don't really know what's going to come out of you. And so we got to get you here. Uh, and who knows when that's going to happen. And, hey, yeah, you're great uh, when you're comfortable. But you just need to know that you're going to get squeezed because we need to see what's on the inside of you. And, uh, and so until that actually happens, um, there's some degree of guessing but I like who he is as a player, and I, I think he's really talented, along with Nate uh, Clover. I do think it's easier for, um, for freshman bigs to play because there aren't as many um, mm -hmm. than it is for freshman guards. But it helps, obviously, if you're really talented. Yeah, and they'll definitely have a lot of good guys to learn from, you know, like we said. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, losing Burns and Nizakwezi and, and Curran's all gone, but all these guys coming back, you mentioned – Kevin O'Banner before as well it's it looks like you guys are going to have a pretty nice squad next year and you were really close to you know the holy grail uh this season you know just right on the cusp of the summit finals you guys had a really uh really tight semifinal game with North Dakota State um and then going forward to next year you know we can kind of 
maybe finish it off with a preview of what you think about next year, but also uh, just in general with obviously, you know, Dave Richmond's squad is always going to be there. South Dakota State, uh, you know, with Douglas Wilson back is expected, expected to be really talented. Um, is your guys' goal to just, you know, go for it and compete for the Summit League title with them? And if so, how do you get there? Yeah, I mean, 100%. No, nobody's sitting here going, I hope we come in second. Um, like, I, I mean, I, I wish we could. Okay, can we start Summit League play tomorrow? Um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's get That's our guys, let's that. get your guys, you know, let's, let's run this back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a little anxious and itchy to go. I think one of the things that happens is – is when you lose, um, we, lo- we lost to North Dakota State in the semifinal. They went on and had a big win in their uh, championship game. I think they won by 40-plus yeah, um, yeah. that next one. But when you realize, like, all right, um, when can we run this back? Um, <laughs> I just think that you're kind of – I mean, that's your mindset. Yeah. And, and I can tell you since, you know, March 9th, since we lost that game, there hadn't been a, a day that goes by. Uh, sometimes nightmares that even wake me up to where you're not eager and anxious to play um, because they're a good program, they're a good team. The reality of is in the Summit League, if you don't have a state in your school name, you haven't won it. Um, (laughs) I mean, South Dakota State and North Dakota State are the only two teams that have won this league. Um, And you know what? Uh, Somebody needs to be good enough in order to, to, to beat them. And that's obviously, I think, what every single team in the Summit League is trying to do. Well, I think you guys are in for a really good year uh, next year. I was, I was excited kind of because I – for this past season because I kind of expected, you know, the, the positive regression to work in your favor, and it obviously did. Um, and, you know, and, and we're big fans of the Summit League, and I think, you know, seeing you guys battle with North Dakota State, South Dakota State, I think South Dakota will still be good. Uh, North Dakota's on the run. I mean, it's, it's just a really good um, – Really good mid-major league, and uh, and we're really looking forward to seeing you play next year. Oral Roberts is the last uh, last school to win it outside of those two schools, and then yeah, I, uh, Oakland, Oakland was in there, but they're Oakland. not they're not there anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you're right. Uh, and you know when when Oral Roberts did it, it was uh, the Midcon League. Yep. And so you know so since since it's been Summit, mm-hmm. um, it's it's only been those two schools. I totally screwed up South Dakota State last year. Both times we played them. Uh, totally my fault. Um, I just I had, you were a really good team, and and, and they kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, I had uh, I I just I approached that one wrong. Uh, that one that one won't happen this year. And in North Dakota State, we split, and then they obviously beat us at the uh, conference tournament. But there are obviously really good teams in this league, and and being prepared, it's not easy to travel. Uh, I like that we're the southernmost school. If you've ever been to North Dakota. It's probably very similar to New Jersey. There's a lot of <laughs> snow everywhere. <laughs> and when you're in the South, from the South, and guys from the South, uh, it's not something that you're really used to. And so I think our guys just from – this is what's required of you physically from the travel to the play. I do think that all of those things over the course of time help in guys understanding what's required of them now in order to win you know, come March. Coach, yeah. it, I know we got we, we don't really have much time left here. We got to wrap up. But when you say you screwed up the South Dakota State games, g- could you give us just a, a quick yeah. digest? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, one, it they have two really good players around the rim. And if you start sending double teams at those guys, Douglas Wilson and Matt Dentlinger can pick you a part. Um because they can pass. And so we went and doubled and they threw out and they were able to make threes. And it was such a bad decision. Um, And, and I thought maybe we could do a better job of it the second time around and and we didn't. So first time, shame on you. Right. Right. Time, shame on me. Both times were shame on me though. (laughs) The offensive spacing, if you go back and watch is brutal, brutal. It ain't, it's brutal. Uh, it's, I, it's, I, I literally watched every game we've played at least three times. Um, especially during these past nine weeks Yeah, that, that, uh, I mean, we were 13 and one at home, South Dakota state's the one that beat us at home, um, this past year. And it's hard for me to get five minutes into that game going, look how bad this is. And that was my fault. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and so you just sit here and go, you know what, we can do a better job in regards to just where we position our guys to give them a better opportunity to make plays. 
Well, I apologize for making you relive it, but I, I, yeah, I appreciate yeah, it's you going. Bad, man. It's bad. <laughs> well, the good news is you're going to get some more cracks next year at, at uh, Wilson. Yeah, thank State. goodness. Um, and they're going to be, you know, the, the big dogs up at the conference. And, and Douglas, I'm sure, will be, you know, in the, a player of the year candidate again. But I think Oral Roberts, again, you guys are really going to be in for a nice year next year. We really appreciate you coming on. Um, and more importantly than anything, we're just excited to get to see you guys playing basketball again as soon as possible. Man, I, I, I hope so. You know, especially here in the South, I think that um, people are – they're going to watch football, and football is going to get played. Uh, it's a big part of the culture here in the South, and obviously we'll take a lot of keys from how football does, and then uh, I think we'll get a better idea just what our season is going to look like. But we're anxiously awaiting 162 days. Uh, until uh, until November the tenth. So who's counting? <laughs> John <We're> Boston. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I know the number is. He sends it out every morning. <laughs> All right, coach. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris, Joe. Thank y'all. Take care. Bye bye.